Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McGrath. Today on the pod, the United States of America has elected Donald Trump again. How will this affect Ontario's relationship with our neighbours to the south? The Ontario Liberals have a new line of attack on the family doctor shortage. Ontario's Integrity Commissioner is retiring in January. How will that affect the office's ongoing investigations? And your column, my column, focuses on a disagreement within the opposition parties over housing. And I've got a piece on a 100-year-old Lieutenant General who is returning to Queen's Park for Remembrance Day, and that is right where he belongs. It's Friday, November 8th, 2024, so let's get to it. JMM, a little sugar for Hello, starters sir. there. I can't believe I'm still in a t-shirt. I know, this wild week of it's November like 20 weather. 20 degrees I, out there. I biked here in shorts earlier this no week. No kidding. Yeah. Are you still wearing them now? I can't see. No, no, I'm wearing jeans now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, while we have this spring lake weather out here right now, I, I saw another sign this past week that, um, well, let's just say it's more evidence that I think an election is coming next spring like, like as opposed a, a to Robin's the year Robin's first call or, or green it's shoots. Something like that. Yes, I'm reading the tea leaves again. It was a given that Doug Ford, when he announced this several years ago, was going to take away the per-vote subsidy from the opposition parties because this was a great way, as the government, he could go out and raise all the money he needs, and he could deprive the opposition parties of any public funding for the election to come. What did he do this past week? Uh, This past week, he announced that, in fact, those subsidies uh, will be extended for another two years. Imagine that. Yes. And Uh, why do we think he did that? Well, uh, at the moment, of course, the um, arrangement of the per-vote subsidy, I mean, because it is literally... It, it reflects the share of the popular vote that the parties received. The Tories got the most votes last time. They are the ones who get the most money through the subsidy scheme. Uh, additionally, another way that this works particularly for the PC party that I think uh, people, it, it might not be intuitive to some people, is that uh, because the NDP and the Liberals got roughly the same number of votes almost in the last identical. election, almost identical, um, they are getting equal shares of uh, the per-vote subsidy. And it's generally speaking to the PC party's benefit uh, to have the uh, Liberal and NDP support evenly divided. Exactly right. And it also takes an issue away, right? I mean, you can imagine going into the next election, the two, op- well, three if you count the Greens as well, Liberals, New Democrats, Greens, all saying this nasty, pinched, awful government is taking away our per-vote subsidy, not letting us compete on an even playing field with them. Anti-democratic, how awful. And Doug Ford avoided all of that by saying, have the votes, have the subsidies, we'll keep them for another two years. Yeah, some, some fights are not worth picking, and the government has opted not to pick this one. Indeed. Uh, they may be up for another fight coming, and we'll get to that right next. Here comes issue one. Premier Doug Ford was at the Economic Club of Canada this week, where he stressed the importance of avoiding protectionism, no matter the result of the U.S. election. Let's have a listen. Nine million Americans wake up every morning to go to work to produce goods and services for Ontario. So that's a real solid statement when we go down there, and I've been talking to the many governors weekly uh, and congressmen and women and senators uh, just to make sure they understand it's the Can-Am approach. Can-Am approach, meaning Canada, America, of course, and uh you know, with the, what do they call it? USMACA? United <laughs> yes, States? U.S.-Mexico-Canada Canada Agreement. Trade Agreement, formerly NAFTA. Um, there's an, a review of that, you know, every, every now and then, and there will be a review of this. And now that Donald Trump is going to be the next president of the United States, uh, obviously it is in Ontario's deeply held interest that uh, tariffs be avoided and that free trade between our province and all of the American states continue. And You've got to wonder what the odds are that President Trump will try to impose a 10% tariff, not only on all the other countries he doesn't like, but on us as well. What what does it look like? Well, you know, we can refer back to uh, the first Trump administration, and uh, I'm going to have to get used to saying that phrase. Um, And, uh, you know, people can recall, maybe some of our listeners are too young, but like it it was a really chaotic time. It was very difficult for governments to, to, uh, Canadian governments to to, uh, deal with uh, the uh, uh, Trump administration in part because you you were never quite sure what the policy was going to be. So uh, the 
now president elect has uh, you know he spent the, the year uh, saying that he was going to impose a, a, a uniform 10 percent tariff on all imported goods uh, into the United States which includes us one would think mm -hmm. um, unless we get some kind of carve out um, but if they give a carve out to us what other countries do they give a like mm -hmm. we just don't know yeah. right uh, I'm not frankly terribly optimistic right now um, the uh, I, I think Let's just start from the proposition that that Donald Trump uh, means what he says, and you know what. If that's correct, then yeah, it's a ten percent tariff on Canadian goods. Maybe that's overly pessimistic right now. Um, a report from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce said that a, a tit for tat trade war between us and the states could result in a five percent loss to the Canadian GDP. That's billions, uh, billions and billions of dollars. Uh, the report also said that Canada should be ready to play hardball uh, with mm. the states, uh, Premier Ford or uh, whatever Premier we might have after a p potential uh, coming election, uh, will need to be ready for uh, what comes next. Um, but there's a real possibility of uh, economic pain, particularly in some sectors, right? I mean, uh, one of the ones that I think people might not think about, but like Canadian dairy, of which a lot of that is in on Ontario, um, has been a constant uh, source of complaints from uh, American uh, Midwestern states, uh, Midwestern states that have twice now uh, been a, a key part of the bloc uh, that sent Donald Trump to the White House. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we don't have time to delineate all the, the various uh, economic factors here, but that's just one that struck me immediately. I have to confess, I am utterly fascinated with the relationship between the president-elect and the premier of Ontario. Because you know in your gut, you know in your heart, Doug Ford loves Donald Trump, right? They are populist politicians uh, from, <laughs> from the get-go. They are simpatico ideologically. They are simpatico in governing style. But somewhere along the way, Doug Ford came to understand that the vast majority of people in the province of Ontario wouldn't vote for Donald Trump and don't like Donald Trump. Yeah. And during COVID, we re well remember when the Premier of Ontario took a poke at the President of the United States saying, you know, I love America and I want to love this President, but I just don't like what he's doing on X, Y, and Z, which were very anti-Canadian, anti-Ontario measurements, uh, measures, excuse me. So. I'm going to be fascinated to watch how this relationship unfolds. We know that Ford and Trump, in their hearts, want to get along, and they want to do—they're I mean, they're just so simpatico in so many ways. But I think the premier also understands that you've got to take on the American president from time to time, not only because it's good politics, but it's good policy as well. Right. And, uh, you know, again, we're not going to delineate every single economic sector here, but the, just one that I think you have to mention uh, at the moment. Um, we don't know exactly what the final makeup of the House of Representatives will be, right. but uh, a Republican trifecta is, a, is still a possibility. And... Uh, we don't know what the fate of the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the subsidies for electric vehicles mm -hmm. specifically uh, is going to be in the coming uh, year or years. And Ontario's auto sector and investments in Ontario's auto sector depend uh, enormously on investments that are made in the U.S., particularly in Michigan and Indiana. And if there is a change in policy and American automakers stop spending uh, on electric vehicles and that uh, that transition to electric vehicles, um, this government, uh, provincially and the federal government, have spent billions of dollars to bring EV manufacturing facilities to uh, this province. And if the American side of that equation starts to fall away, uh, a whole bunch of those plants could suddenly look uh, uneconomic and potentially like a, a, a very expensive wasted investment. There may be one reason for optimism, because we know, again, Donald Trump in his heart, well, he said it, he's a drill, baby, drill kind of guy. He's an oil and gas kind of guy, and he is uh, personally not all that enamored with the whole EV movement. Yeah. However, who was his best friend during this past election campaign? <laughs> Elon Musk. Elon yes. Musk is right. So uh, he does not want to do anything that would run afoul of Elon Musk. And you better believe that Elon Musk continues to want government policy to move in the direction of favoring EVs. So who knows? Maybe the president will put a little water in his wine on this one. It, it is uh, a slim read to uh, hang our hopes on, but I, I will take it today. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a good idea. And with that, we're off to issue two. The Ontario Liberals have a new line of attack on the health care crisis in the province, and it's caused a bit of a stir at Queen's Park. Let's have a look. This is a map of the top 10 conservative ridings Order. with the most people that don't have a Order. family doctor. The member from Pobico North, all 
also the Premier of Ontario, who has. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will take his seat. And at number one, we have the member from Etobicoke Centre with 40,000 people in a riding without a family doctor. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> why won't the Premier let his own members fight for their own constituents' most basic health care needs? I have to say that's a very clever new line of attack that the Liberals are taking. That is the MPP for Don Valley East in Toronto, Adil Shamji, who I remind everybody is a medical doctor. So he not only knows this issue as the critic for the Liberals, but from his entire professional life. Um, uh, I'd say a pretty interesting new line of attack, eh? Yeah, so this came this week. Um, the Liberals uh, are using a data set that was produced by the Ontario Medical Association. Uh, and if people want to go to the OMA's website, they can. Uh, there's a map that breaks down these numbers riding by riding. Uh, the OMA, just for context here, the OMA is projecting that by 2026, 4.5 million Ontarians will lack a primary health care provider. Mm. Uh, so while Shamji... Uh, as befits a debate in the House, the Shamju uh, was, was focusing on uh, uh, Tory ridings. Uh, our listeners should, of course, keep in mind that Tories hold most ridings in the legislature, uh, including the ridings in Ontario's biggest cities. Uh, so naturally, there are going to be a lot of Tory seats on that list. Uh, but uh, based on our look at the data, when you uh, look at uh, two of the top three ridings are uh, actually uh, Algoma Manitoulin, uh, which is uh, currently held by the independent MPP Michael Mantha, uh, Spadina Fort York, which is an NDP riding held by Chris Glover, uh, and then there is Etobicoke Centre, uh, King of Surma's riding. Etobicoke Centre, which would be, as the Premier calls it, in the great state of Etobicoke. Yes. That's what he likes to call also, it. Also, Ford country. Yes, Ford <laughs> Nation country, that's right. Now, these numbers, I gather, are all from the year 2022, so it is, I was going to say likely, I would say it's probable that the yeah. numbers are even worse today, now that we're two years later from that. What else do we know about these people who don't have a family doctor? According to the OMA, they are overwhelmingly likely to be uh, 18 to 39 years old, uh, male, uh, some form of uh, marginalized community, uh, and they mostly, although you saw Algoma Manitoulin on that list, uh, they are mostly living in uh, urban areas. Uh, so this is, you know, if you want to think of a demographic that the, the province uh, needs to uh, look at, obviously we talk a lot about uh, the aging population and the need for long-term care and elder care, uh, but in this case, the population that seems most acutely lacking a primary uh, health care provider uh, is actually a relatively young men. Hmm. Uh, now, I mean, not having a family doctor, that's like irritating if you're an otherwise healthy person. Uh, but according to a recent study in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, one in three cancer diagnoses are now happening in an emergency room in Ontario. Uh, given what we know about uh, Ontario's hospitals, it won't surprise people that uh, one doctor, uh, Dr. Raghu Venagopal, told Global News that it's extremely common for him to have to deliver this kind of life-changing news to people in a hospital hallway. Uh, hmm. Hardly the kind of setting most of us would want for that kind of life event. Indeed, indeed. Now, uh, while we're on the subject of health care, there were some other developments this week on the issue of cancer care and breast cancer screening in particular. Yeah. What's the story there? Uh, so the uh, province is lowering the age of a self-referral for uh, breast cancer screening, um, just if, in case... It's not obvious to people, you know, there are some procedures that you need to get a doctor's referral before you can access that care. There are other types of procedures you do not need and you can just self-refer yourself to. Uh, the uh, government is, is lowering the age uh, from 50 to 40 uh, so that uh, people uh, 40 years and older can now just self-refer uh, for uh, breast cancer screening. Um, seems to have, uh, from my read of uh, the, the reaction among doctors, seems to be uh, a broadly uh, positive move. Uh, but again, you know, just getting the screening is only one stop in the healthcare process. People uh, need to have a primary care physician to help manage. I mean, if God forbid, you know, you find cancer, you need somebody to help you manage the whole care uh, plan. Uh, just sticking with healthcare news, I, I, I want to stick this one in because it involves an alma mater of mine. Uh, the government did also announce a new nursing program in uh, at Carleton University. It did, yes, in Ottawa. Very yes. good. Uh, go Ravens. <laughs> um, uh, they expect the program to train 200 new nurses a year uh, when it is up and running. Uh, the uh, This, of course, builds on a lot of investments the government is making in terms of uh, spinning up training capacity for uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, with doctors, the province is uh, talking about uh, keeping new families here by uh, uh, promising to pay for their schooling. 
these are all, uh, I, I think, meritorious programs, but mm -hmm. they are all going to uh, take some time to deliver the people uh, that, uh, frankly, the health care system is going to need in the years. Anybody who's been to the hospital knows nurses are not only essential, but run off their feet most of the time when they're in there. And a lot of them are getting to the age where they're ready to retire, and we've got to be replacing those retiring nurses, and it's hard work, and it's not only that, it's shift work. It's it, When you're working in a hospital, you know, you could be days this week, overnights next week. It's difficult on family life. So, yeah, we got to keep that pipeline going. Absolutely. Okay. And with that, we're off to issue three. Ontario's Integrity Commissioner, J. David Wake, will retire in January. His retirement comes in the wake... See what I did there? Yeah, I like yeah. the pun. <laughs> In the wake of the Greenbelt investigation, you'll remember Premier Ford got caught on tape promising developers he'd open up the Greenbelt for development. Then, when you know what hit the fan, he changed his mind. And then he said, actually, we need more housing, so we're going to go gung-ho into developing the Greenbelt. And then, when it became scandalous how much developers were going to make, the Premier reversed himself again and said, no development. Okay, that's the background going back about six years. What else do we need to know about I just, this? First of all, really uh, masterfully uh, laying out <laughs> the, the timeline on this, because even frankly, I forget just how long, far back this goes now. Um, on the Integrity Commissioner, um, this is a bit odd, right? The Integrity Commissioner is uh, appointed to a, a five-year term. This is a, a legislative officer uh, appointed by the legislature. So um, this is not a case that where somebody can be like fired by the Premier. There's uh, no... Uh, sense in which uh, the government is retaliating against Wake for his no, reports. No, he's not a premier's appointment. He's a legislative appointment. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know what? i got to say, just forgive me for interrupting here. Do you know who I bumped into last week in Ottawa? J. David Wake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Quite accidentally. And he did say to me, yes, I'm leaving early, but I think he's 74, 5, yes. 6 years old, something like that. So it's not like he... It's not like he's bailing early. No, no. Um, so it is, it is early in the sense of he, he is appointed to a five-year term. This would normally have gone to 2026, so he is uh, leaving a bit early. But as you say, uh, there are um, understandable reasons why he would do that. Um, but, you know, there is also this active RCMP investigation into the Greenbelt scandal that will draw at least somewhat, I think, on some of the findings that Wake made in his investigation uh, of that uh, uh, event. Um, there are also questions. I mean, the NDP has asked his office to investigate uh, the uh, Ontario Place deal with Therma Canada. So uh, in an ideal world, maybe not the perfect time to leave. <laughs> no, and, you know, but uh, as is often the case with these things, there's no ideal time to leave. But when the clock hits midnight, uh, you know, you make your decisions. Yeah. If there's no integrity commissioner per se at the moment, like who's in charge of whatever's supposed to happen next? Right. So the the law that creates the integrity commissioner uh, office does also uh, allow for a deputy integrity commissioner who assumes all of the powers of the office when there is a vacancy uh, at the very top. Uh, so in this case, that is deputy integrity commissioner Catherine Motherwell, uh, who will continue to keep the, the office running. Um, the, the legislature has a process for this kind of thing where they, they somewhat quietly gather some MPPs together and, and they go through a process of uh, essentially, you know, hiring the new uh, integrity commissioner. Uh, they, you know, historically, I would say these uh, appointments tend to be made unanimously by the legislature. It's not the kind of thing that you want it to be big and contentious. It's not the kind of thing that looks good if the government is picking their guy and saying, we want, we want a friendly integrity commissioner friendly to our interests that just has to be unanimity on this call exactly yeah. and so um although uh, tell me i might be wrong about this but i think only officially constituted parties get to choose which means i think the tories and the new democrats are the only ones who have to agree on this the yes. liberals and greens are not a factor because they're not they don't have 12 seats yeah so there's the there's like a, a, a hiring committee process if you want to think of that and it will just be uh, uh, probably like two Tories and a New Democrat or something like that, or maybe it'll be the Speaker and a Tory and a New Democrat or something like that. And the Liberals and the Green and the other independents will not be a part of that pro process at all. And then the, f the, the, the final appointment will be a vote in the legislature with all MPPs present. Um, and uh, But the problem now is, like, tick-tock, there's an election coming. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, whether we have a, uh, a permanent full-time integrity commissioner by the time of the next election, um, 
uh, it's not impossible, but they're really going to have to, you know, uh, pick up their socks because we don't even know necessarily if they will be coming back after this winter break. What's the hot rumor? <laughs> do you want to, you can you say? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to be discreet about this because uh, I don't was give up your source o- offline yeah. that uh, uh, I, I was at the legislature earlier this week and I happened to speak with an MPP who uh, was of the opinion that not only will the legislature uh, rise relatively early in December, he does not expect to be there very late into uh, the month of December, uh, he also was pretty sure that the MPPs will not be called back after uh, they rise in December, that the government could uh, dissolve the legislature and call an election in something like January and February instead of bringing MPPs back uh, after... They normally come back around February. Yeah, they normally come back the week after Family Day in February. This person suggested that was uh, not going to happen. Hmm... Just one MPP's voice. Uh, I will say someone I think has uh, a, a good read of events at uh, Queen's Park, but uh, is not necessarily going to be correct. Uh, but definitely a, a, a rumor that I, I thought I could share. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the potential for additional questions and speculation is massive here. Yes. But we'll leave that for another yes. week. <laughs> In the meantime, off to your column, my column. Time now for our regular feature. You know it, you love it, you adore it. It's called Your Column, My Column, in which JMM and I chat about the columns that we write for TVO.org and what we've got up this past week. You want to start us off, my friend? Sure. Well, uh, you, our listeners, everybody within the sound of my voice can reset their clocks because uh, McGrath is going to talk about housing again. Mm. (laughs) What a shock. Um, So this week I wrote about a, a disagreement between, not between the government and the opposition, but within the opposition, between the Liberals and the NDP, uh, over how to address the housing crisis in Ontario. Uh, the NDP have, uh, for a while now, been talking about the need for a, a public agency that would get the province back into the, the business of building affordable housing directly. Um, the Liberals, on the other hand, uh, they did not vote for this motion that the NDP presented earlier this week, um, and they said that what is needed is not uh, what they called a new NDP-run super agency, um, which vaguely sounds like the Avengers to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the Liberals would, uh, they have a, a bill before the legislature right now. Uh, they, they think that uh, passing that or something like it would uh, uh, legalize more forms of housing and would let the market address uh, the housing shortage. Um, interesting disagreement within the opposition on its own, uh, but I, I, th- this was one of those cases where I wanted to write about it because I think MPPs at Queen's Park do not understand how many obstacles there are between changing a policy by like passing a bill in the legislature and the long chain of events that have to happen before that actually materializes mm-hmm. in terms of new housing. Um, housing advocates in Canada have started using the phrase legalize housing. In fact, like the, the federal housing minister, Sean Fraser, uses that phrase a lot in his speeches. We need to legalize housing again. Um, I like the phrase. I, I, I want more politicians to use it, uh, but it's so much harder uh, than it sounds. Um, Toronto. Toronto City Council tried to legalize fourplexes, the exact policy that the Liberals and NDP agree on. And last month, they discovered actually that the the, the bylaws that they had amended did not do the job. Hmm. That they, despite doing all the right things, uh, the, the the zoning bylaw is so complicated that it turns out there's even more obstacles than they thought. Hmm. Um so my, my message in this column, my message to MPPs, particularly those uh, in, in the opposition who uh, are basically unanimous in the need to, to legalize fourplexes around the province, uh, is that it's it's a good idea. I personally think it's the right idea. Um, it's so much more than just passing a legislation. And uh, if any of them do form government after the next election, it is a, a fight that they need to be ready for, and I don't think they are yet. It's so fascinating. There feels like there is so much momentum in the province right now to get stuff done, right, to get stuff built. But, of course, with interest rates, with a lack of, you know, a shortage of skilled trades to do these things, with uh, the market being what it is, we've had a real slowdown in getting homes built right now. And as you point out, there's still so many obstacles to legalizing the building of homes. It's funny, even with all of the effort behind getting it done, it's still not getting done. No, and I mean, you even see it in the government's own budgetary projections yeah. where uh, uh, housing starts are predicted to uh, continue to be, uh, frankly, kind of, I could say mediocre. Maybe I will charitably say middling. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How about yourself, Steve? I want to talk to you about one of my favorite people in the whole world, and he really is. This guy's name is Richard Romer. 
Richard Romer, back in the 1920s, when he was a little kid, looked up in the sky one day and he saw an airplane. And at that moment, he decided, I want to be a pilot. And 14 or 15 years later, he volunteered to serve in World War II. He was a flyer, did surveillance, spying, if you like, <laughs> surveillance in his Maverick airplane. He's flying over France, 1944. He spots a German command car down on the ground, driving somewhere in France. He calls it into HQ. They bring a squadron. They bomb the car. Turns out Erwin Rommel, hmm. the German commander, yeah. was in that car. Almost killed him. So Richard Romer has this kind of connection with and brush with, you know, history with yeah. this very famous person. Uh, fast forward a little bit. After the war, he becomes the chief of staff to the premier of Ontario, John Robarts, in the 1960s. And in fact, he was the guy who had carriage of the file to get the Science Centre built. So if you like going to the Science Centre in Don Mills, uh, it's there on that site because Richard Romer did all the legwork to help make it happen. Oh, wow. Anyway, he has maintained his military connection throughout the years. He was a major general. He is now a lieutenant general. That is the highest rank possible in the Canadian military, lieutenant general. And one of the things I always used to love about Richard Romer is that he would show up on Remembrance Day at Queen's Park and, quote, unquote, give the speech for the troops. And, you know, all the dignitaries, the premier, the lieutenant governor, whoever else, somebody else in the military would come and they'd have these speeches and it would be very formal. And Richard Romer would just get up to the microphone and riff <laughs> for three or four or five minutes about his time in the military and speaking on behalf of the troops. And it was just so it was so honest and authentic and memorable and good. And he did it every year, and it was wonderful. It was a real highlight. And a few years ago, he got sick, mm -hmm. and he had a near-death experience, and so he hasn't been there in a while. Doug Ford called him a couple of months ago to inquire about his health. Mm -hmm. He's better now. And the premier invited him to come back to Queen's Park November 11th to speak for the troops one more time. Wonderful. Wonderful is right. And um, I'm going to ask uh, our director, Sheldon Osmond, here to bring up a few pictures. Here we go. This is 12 years ago. Look at that. Look at the medals on his chest. That's Richard Romer 12 years ago at Queen's Park right after Remembrance Day. My daughter's going to kill me for showing her <laughs> as such a little kid, but that's, that's her anyway. Uh, let's do the next picture here. There he is, Richard Romer, with Premier Ford. That's probably six years ago, uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, I think the Premier's first, actually, is... Uh, Premier of Ontario, and again, showing up to give the speech on behalf of the troops behind that black, or in front of that black granite wall at Queen's Park, the monument there. Okay, I visited General Romer uh, six weeks ago at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, where he now lives in the Veterans Wing, and there he is holding his autobiography, which he wrote many years ago. He's written 30 books, if you can imagine, over God. the years. That's him holding his autobiography. JMM, do you want to guess how old he is right now? Doesn't look a day over 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. I asked him, how do you feel? And he said, I feel about 70. He's actually 100. He's 100 years old. He's going to be 101 in January. And this is, you're looking at the front of him there. There's the back of his oh. scooter. <laughs> and look at that personalized license plate, L-G-E-N, Lieutenant General. Wonderful. And I asked him once, I said, you know, I noticed when he was getting care at the, um, at the place where he lives, everybody calls him General. And I said... That's interesting. Does everybody call you general here? He says, yes, I demand it. <laughs> I've, I've worked hard to get that label, that title, and so, uh, yes, I, uh, I insist on it. Um, I can't wait to see Richard Romer on Monday, back where he belongs, giving this speech on behalf of the troops at Queen's Park. Fingers crossed that he remains healthy and he can get the job done, because that will be a, a tremendous highlight. And with that, let's go to the mailbag. If you've got a burning question or insightful comment, please send it along to onpolitics at tvo.org. we got a lot of stuff to get through this week, eh? Yeah, we put out mm -hmm. the uh, question. Obviously, we had a bunch of guests on the podcast in recent weeks, and we uh, asked our viewers and uh, listeners uh, what they thought about having the guests on. And uh, so we've got a bunch of feedback uh, that we are just going to start going through uh, rapid fire style okay, right now. Let's get the graphics coming up. Here we go. This is John Follis who says, I offer a thumb up, just a thumb. I offer a thumb up to some interviews. Part of our political responsibility is listening to policy and trying to determine if said policy is credible and or presented by a credible person. Okay. One thumb up from John. And from Karen 
Leahy or Lehay. Uh, uh, I wouldn't want to see guests every week, but the occasional one is fine with me. I really appreciated you having the provincial party leaders on the pod so that I could get to know them a bit. Yeah, we had three of the four provincial party leaders on. Plus the finance minister. Plus the finance minister. Not yet the premier. We have not yet had him. We haven't given up hope. Invitation remains open. Yes, it does. (laughs) Uh, This one's from Jim and Francis Oliver, who said, We enjoyed your recent political guests and find it enlightening. Hope you can continue with this. Here's one from Gary Davis. Uh, You can put me right up at the top of the list, not in favor of seeing guests on the show. Uh No matter what type of guests, Steve and John Michael are so knowledgeable and up to speed and can speak without political bias. I crave that independence. Well, thank you for that, Gary. That's nice. Let's do one more. This is Malcolm Campbell who says, appreciate your fabulous guests. How about some Windsor guests? (laughs) Okay, yeah, we'll... we'll, uh We'll find out who we can put on the air from Windsor at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to bring voices in from all over the province. Yeah. Now, uh, as you can tell there, not everybody agrees on what we should do. So John Michael and I and Matthew O'Mara, our producer, will, uh, what shall I say? We'll try to find the sweet spot yes. of compromise that makes everybody happy. Yes. That's what we'll find. Yeah. We'll do it. Yeah, we, we will find it. I, I, I enjoy this, the, 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 the riffing between the two of us. I also enjoy having the guests on occasionally. Okay. So. The sweet spot of compromise. Here it comes. Again, if you'd like to ask about content on the show, please email us at onpolitics at tvo.org. And that is the On Poly podcast for this Friday, November 8th, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so you get notified each time a new episode is available. And you can see the video version of the podcast on the TVO Today YouTube channel. Any feedback you have, we're happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. Write us an email at onpolitics at tvo.org. Please include your first and last name and where you're located. This week's episode was produced and edited by Matthew O'Mara, video editing by Colin Kish. Production support from Jonathan Hallowell and TVO's digital media services team. Our managing editor is Katie O'Connor. Lori Few is the executive producer of digital. John Ferry is vice president, programming and content. We always like to thank our wonderful studio crew for making the video podcast look so darn good. And our shout out this week, you see all of those graphics that come up with the letters on them and the pictures from Richard Romer at Queen's Park, you know, all that stuff. Somebody's got to be in charge of all that stuff. The Chiron guy. So Donnie Swanson, you get the shout out this week. Get a haircut and we'll see you next week. (laughs) I say that because he's got hair down to here. Anyway, until next Friday, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.